A packed annual general meeting got underway behind closed doors. Amid much speculation about the club's flagging financial situation, management decided to spill it out to members. Our cash flow is, uh, is zilch at the moment. We need immediate cash. The club is labouring under a $2.5 million debt and an immediate cash flow problem. Sums of money that we need short term aren't that large uh, and I can't really disclose the full extent of it but it, it's certainly under uh, the figure of $200,000. The club spent about that much on lighting the ground as a proviso to entering the National League even though other clubs didn't face such a requirement. An insolvency consultant has been appointed to devise a restructuring of the club's finances. One option being considered is to attempt to sell the grounds and stands on a leaseback arrangement. Club members responded with an immediate whip around, opened debentures and conducted raffles. Staff donated their labour. The club's management is confident that if it can last out this season, the breakers will see a better 1994. The team's on-field performance will be discussed at a board meeting tomorrow night. Andrew Lobb, NBN News. The idea is as simple as 2 plus 2. Take some of the country's leading mathematicians, give them eight of the most challenging problems and wait for the solutions. For example, how would maths help manage a hospital's operating theatre? The problem is to come, come up with a way of, of um, simulating um, waiting lists on the computer so that we can, we can play with different scenarios. It's a problem that can be broken down into components. It's, it's from, from woe to go, it's a very complex thing. Or what about simulating the dip coating process for spectacle lenses? The problem is to produce a uniformly thick, thin coating on the surface of a spectacle lens to give it greater scratch resistance. We'll be looking at new models, uh, new mathematics for the flow of these strange liquids. The Mathematics in Industry Study Group will spend the rest of the week pondering these puzzles, which companies have paid up to $3,000 to have solved. We have had a lot of uh, companies interested in having their problems solved, uh, and we really did have to bring it down to eight problems, so it's been a marvellous uh, response to our uh, quest for problems. There will be ongoing proceedings, but by Friday we hope to have some answers. The Hunters' 266 schools reopened today as nearly 4,800 teachers began preparing for the year ahead. Time was spent finalising staff arrangements and classroom studies. Garden Suburb Primary almost fell victim to the recent bushfires. These burnt trees evidence of a close call for the school playground. One of the Hunters' 16 new primary principals is Jeanette Andrews. For the past five years, Mrs Andrews was principal at the School of the Air based at Broken Hill, where talkback radio replaced face-to-face -face contact. That's something I'm looking forward to here, seeing the children all of the time. We had a lot of contact with them over air and occasional visits to them on their stations or them coming in to us, but uh, not there all day, every day. Meanwhile, thousands of new TAFE students converged on the Hunter Institute of Technology's 15 campuses across the region. Students starting courses for the first time joined one of the many queues. This year, the Newcastle campus making sure all went smoothly. And we've had more staff involved and we have the areas better designated. And secondly, for high demand courses, the pre-application has been a big success where people have been able to apply, be accepted and be notified. Cold refreshments were supplied by the Institute's Association and plenty of advice was on hand. It's estimated around 23,000 students will be enrolled in TAFE studies by March and up to 46,000 by the end of the year. Melinda Smith, NBN News.
breakers took a few pot shots throughout the first half, but they were stopped before we Coach Graham Jennings played tough man on man football but fell foul of the referee after being caught tagging his young opponent. The breakers were looking good to go home with a draw, with goalkeeper Clint Gosling playing one of his best games of the season. But he quickly transformed from hero to villain. A minute later, Sydney United could have made it 2-0 when Gosling was caught well outside the goal mouth. The conveyor belts are running day and night, pumping out wheat from across northern New South Wales. For Grain Corp across the state, 1994 is looking to be a bumper year. This year's harvest in excess of 5 million tonnes represents probably the biggest single receivable year in the last decade. 1.2 million tonnes of that will go through Newcastle. In the month of January alone, 135,000 tonnes went through the port. This shipment is going to Taiwan. More ships are lining up for the golden crop. Meanwhile, Grain Corp is taking truckloads of a special wheat variety for an unusual order. A Turkish company is taking 40,000 tonnes of durum wheat for making noodles and spaghetti. It's the biggest shipment of durum to ever leave the port. News of the changes surfaced late last year when Education Minister Virginia Chadwick announced plans to cut the number of cluster directors. Well, the changes are that uh, the organisation is reducing the number of cluster directors to a new position which is called Director of Schools from, in this particular reason, from a region from 14 to 9. Head of the Hunters Education Department, Helga Colby, has overseen the reshuffle. From next Monday, the nine school directors will be in charge of a rearranged number of high schools and their feeder primary schools. We had to redistribute schools to different uh, groups of schools uh, because the numbers changed and therefore the relationship uh, has changed. The changes have meant redeployment for four former cluster directors. Also advertised two senior administrative positions. A former cluster director will take over as Director of Administration and Finance. Dr Don Reeves will keep his position as Personnel Chief. According to Ms Colby, the changes represent a redirection, not a reduction of resources. The resources which have uh, been freed through the reorganisation of the cluster directors, uh, these resources are now being put into, into early learning, uh, kindergarten and year one. The 100 teachers which the Minister has announced really are being resourced from that source. Melinda Smith, NBN News. The Lord Mayor was special guest speaker at today's business club luncheon, the first for the year. Outlining the highlights of 1993, he included the many achievements in tourism, sporting, cultural and community affairs and council's own administration. The Lord Mayor believes adopting a customer orientated approach and the appointment of a senior management team to guide the city's enhancement plan are solid foundations for the future. 
to see that every aspect of city life was covered and moved forward, particularly our Environmental Protection and Planning Authority, which means that we will continue to have the city the best in the world probably, as far as steel cities are concerned, we're probably the best in the world. Looking to the year ahead, the Lord Mayor believes it's time for the enhancement plan to be turned into a reality. What we are going to do this year is achieve the things that those things have been set up to do. And uh, they are manifold and part of every facet of the life of the city. Melinda Smith, NBN News. Located on Lake Road Walls Inn, the complex marks the fruition of 20 years of planning. Now housed in cramped quarters in Hamilton, the Seventh-day Adventist School plans to move to its new location by July for the start of third term. Macquarie College will be built in four stages, the first to include a primary and high school as well as a community preschool. I think uh, the increasing trend is over the next few years to see uh, preschools being attached to uh, schools and colleges uh, in recognition of the changing workplace uh, patterns. Also planned, a church, a community centre and retirement village bringing the whole project to seven million dollars. It's uh, part of uh, an ongoing desire to serve uh, the needs of the community in recognition uh, that uh, the community uh, uh, has uh, a desire for you know, a Christian alternative and uh, we like to think that uh, we're able to, to do that and provide that sort of program in a, in a caring and Christian environment. When you talk about swimmers, they don't come much better than this young lady. She, well we think it's she, it's a bit hard to tell, was noticed exhausted struggling up Newcastle's Nobby's Beach this morning. While it's not unusual to see fairy penguins in the surf, it's certainly an uncommon sight on a city beach. Usually when you approach them they'll, they'll run back into the water you know, and, and go, but this bloke was a bit tired. And to protect the bird from dogs, she was brought into the clubhouse to wait for experts from the Native Animal Trust Fund to take over caring for her. It appears she somehow cut her feet. So, just for a few hours, the club had a new member, or should we say, a junior nipper. Peter Ryan, NBN News. Still enjoying the fruits from last year's successes, the Hunter Valley Theatre Company is embarking on another venture. It's joined forces with companies from Wagga Wagga, Penrith and Wollongong, forming a production cooperative under the New South Wales State Theatre Project. We cover a lot of people, both area-wise and population-wise, and the idea is to bring theatre, the best theatre we can, to those people. To survive, regional theatre companies depend largely on government funding. It's hoped the project will also help keep the stage doors open. The number of theatre companies, regional theatre companies, has dropped in, in the last few years and we need to just keep our, 
our heads above that bit of water and, and showing the flag all the time. So, yeah, we decided we'd take a proactive stand. Rehearsals for the first production start at the Playhouse in two weeks. The comedy Choices opens in Newcastle next month before heading off on a regional tour. They're going to see us more often. They're going to see something from the professional theatre companies much more often. We're hoping that that will be an advantageous thing for them. And we really think that we've got a great product and we can share it. Eight weeks ago, these four young ladies, aged 15 and 16, decided they wanted to row a surfboat. They then convinced Nobby Surf Club member Cole Richards to train them. Seems like a lot of hard work to me. Oh, it is, believe me. Uh, when we started, we had bruises and everything, but we got, we got used to it. The girls are busy preparing for the Newcastle Branch Championships this weekend. With no women's division, the girls will be competing against boys in the junior boat section. In doing so, they'll be making history, being the first female surfboat crew to compete in Newcastle Branch Championships. Cole says girls' surfboat crews was inevitable. The women now have uh, the uh, Diamond Lady, which is equivalent to the men's uh, Ironman event. They have their own surf race, they have their own uh, board and ski section. Colin believes a separate women's rowing competition will be established in its own right within the next two years. In the meantime, his girls will keep practising, and while they may be short on experience, they're long on enthusiasm. These young ladies have been with us now for some two months and uh, if some of the men showed the dedication that they do, I'm sure some of the other boat sweeps would be very happy. Catherine Lamond, NBN News. This is the cause of concern, a large site operated by Port Stephens Council with open pits full of septic tank and chemical toilet effluent. Windia Creek lies about 50 metres from the dump and it runs into the Hunter River. Local tomato farmer John Meredith's property backs onto the creek. Sometimes you just see a, a grey sludge going down there and sometimes just, just trying to work here, the smell of it is you know, almost unbearable. You almost need to wear your gas mask to, to work this far from the creek. We're concerned that there's a health risk. We're concerned that uh, some of the chemicals being used uh, have no need to be used and we're concerned that it's even there at all. In a letter last month to local state government member Bob Martin, the Environment Protection Authority said the site does not currently operate with an EPA approval or licence. The EPA believes that the Raymond Terrace Sewage Treatment Works is the most appropriate location for disposal of septic tank and chemical toilet effluent, and that use of this night soil depot should be discontinued as soon as practicable. 
There is no, uh, no reason why Hunter Water can't take the whole lot. Council said today it had closed the dump down due to recent tests on the site. It will make a final decision once the full results come through later this year. Jason Neuenhoff, NBN News. It's like selling coal to Newcastle, sheep to New Zealand or ice to the Eskimos. Three 40-foot containers full of toys would seem the last thing that Taiwan needs. But not so, according to John Middleton from Dingbats for Kids. We went to Asia to buy equipment and I took some samples and met some people and they decided that the gear was good enough and they'd give it a go. After just two years in the business, husband and wife team John and Lorraine Middleton have built a toy empire. They sell their plastic playthings to most major retail stores in Australia and have had interest from countries such as Saudi Arabia, Japan and South Africa. Not a bad effort, seeing as though their inspiration came from three-year-old son, Luke. Well, we've got a three-year-old son who they decided, or well, we decided we would build him some toys and from there it grew. Today's $50,000 consignment will arrive in Taiwan next month. Young Luke personally made sure all the toys were up to scratch. He's the product tester, he's a little test pilot, yeah. Christopher Bartle is a hero in British equine circles after he became the highest placed Englishman at an Olympics event for dressage. He finished sixth at the LA Games and is now a coach with Britain's next world championship squad. Today riders paid $100 for an intense 45 minute training session. Bartle spends most of the class within reach of the rider and horse, finding faults that could mean valuable competition points in dressage. Well, you know what they say, a, an expert comes from 50 miles away and a profit comes from overseas. Some of the advice doesn't sound very technical, but he says the simplest mistakes are often overlooked. Highlighting the problem can make an enormous improvement in the rider's performance. Sometimes that's, uh, it's very apparent, you get really very dramatic changes. Other times, because perhaps the rider is very tense and nervous, or the horse is very tense and nervous, then it takes a longer time to break down some of these tensions. Bartle will hold another three days of lessons at Lock and Bar before moving to Queensland to coach the state three-day squad. Warren Spink is keen to put the last few weeks behind him. There's um, something like... I've already forgotten about. Spink had been placed on the transfer list, but with coach Jim Foley no longer with the team, one of the NSL's top goal scorers was welcomed back to the club. Ironically, at a special function this afternoon, sponsors were given an official photo with the former coach proudly standing alongside. Meanwhile, confirmation that the breakers are here to stay, despite financial concerns. We are alive and well, and we'll continue on in next football season. The club still does have a cash flow problem, an extra $100,000 are needed in the next few months. Peter Ryan, NBN News. Tourism is the state's largest industry. With a turnover of $8 billion annually, it employs 150,000 people. Most international visitors to Australia choose New South Wales as their destination, with Queensland running a close second and quickly closing the gap. Developed um, beyond Brisbane, rolling along Townsville, Mackay, Cairns of course, we are really focusing still on Sydney. In an international sense, one of our issues is we don't get people beyond Sydney well enough. We want to get benefits to all of regional New South Wales. 
To help achieve this, a master plan to direct our industry through to the year 2010 is being formulated. A series of workshops like this one in Newcastle are being held throughout the state to gather information from local industry representatives about what their regions have to offer and what could be improved. American tourism consultant Clive Jones has been employed to coordinate the master plan. He has directed major tourism projects including the Los Angeles Olympics. We saw people coming to Los Angeles two and a half, three years ahead of time because of the Olympics that were going to be held and we saw people coming to Los Angeles two or three years after the Olympics because of what they'd seen during the Games. In all, the Los Angeles Olympics contributed to the local tourism industry for a five-year period and with the Sydney Games only six years away, now is the time to start planning and importantly, not just what will happen in Sydney. Learning from the LA experience, the economic flow on for Southern California was around $350 million. The New South Wales Tourism Master Plan should be completed by June this year. Catherine Lamond, NBN News. David Terrain's life is devoted to karting. He goes to a special school in France which lets him race two days a week. There is only one thing on his mind. I really want to win, so I, uh, I have to think uh, to, to go the, the fastest I can. Uh. The world champ wants to follow Senna and Prost from karts to Formula One. But in the meantime, he's preparing for a karting Grand Prix at Rally near Coffs Harbour on the weekend. Dueling with David at Lake Macquarie today, an 11-year-old whiz kid from Thornton near Maitland. Brendan May is just back from Victoria where he won his third Vic title, adding to his New South Wales rookie title. Yeah, I'm pretty quick. Indeed he is. He can top speeds of 120 kilometres per hour. And sitting just centimetres above the track, that's travelling. Peter Iron, NBN News. Representing 170 shires from the northwest region, the conference discussed a variety of issues from industry and employment to airports and aviation. But the most pressing problem on everyone's lips was the issue of fuel pricing. A draft report has revealed some disturbing practices that are raising suspicions. You find that after we started to put pressure on the collection of information and on the oil companies, it was strange that PSA dropped the distribution price by three cents right on the 1st of January. It's also strange to look at our graphs now and see that some local distributors throughout these areas dropped them immediately. While many service stations may impose a genuine markup on their fuel prices, Mr Mitchell says distribution charges are inflated. I find that you can deliver a 44,000 litre of petrol from Melbourne to Perth for 15 cents a litre. I'm finding carriers who tell me they deliver fuel and much of it interstate from places like Brisbane to Dubbo at 3 cents a litre, from Melbourne to Wagga at 2.9 cents a litre, and much of the fuel on the coast is in what PSA call a freight-free zone. Mr Mitchell says a more in-depth inquiry will be completed by the New South Wales Shires Association in coming months.
By the end of the week, work on the Newcastle Ocean Baths will be finished and architect Deborah McKendry Hunt and interior designer Lucy Tremaine couldn't be happier with the result. Both work for EJE Architects. Deborah was in charge of coordinating earthquake repairs on the baths and the nearby Nobby's Pavilion. But once she'd started, she realised much more was needed. It became obvious that there were further things needed and we looked to try and rejuvenate the facade of the building and to try and put a bit of life back into the, the building, which is such a landmark for Newcastle. With the repairs complete, Lucy chose the colour scheme. I tried to keep them similar without making them look like they were a, a, a reproduction of each other. Um, but I still wanted them to have a bit of character of their own at the same time. The facelift for both buildings cost council and its insurers around $290,000. Another $55,000 was spent on building a shade structure from timber recycled from the old state dockyard and the Darling Harbour wool sheds. Had lots of favourable comments. Uh, all the general public have been swamping us with comments of just how wonderful the colour scheme in particular has come up and comments that they just think it's wonderful that we put some money back into the building to try and bring it up to standard. Jodie McKay, NBN News. Five hundred people enjoyed the festivities at the Dynasty Chalet in Warners Bay. A lion dance was performed to say goodbye to the year of the rooster and welcome in the year of the dog. The Chinese New Year usually lands in January or February, dictated by a lunar calendar that has a 12 moon cycle compared to the English 12 months. Taunting the lion and adding humour to the dance was what the Chinese call a big head Buddha. The 30 minute performance ended with the lion eating a lettuce from a ladder. It is meant to symbolise the whole community reaching new heights and goals this year. Jason Neuenhoff, NBN News.